So good to see you all this morning. So glad that you're here. We're continuing our, uh, our series that we're calling Skeptical. And I want to read, I'm going to start off today by reading a section of scripture to you, okay? This is Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. And here's what it says. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Man, that's kind of a heavy verse to start with this morning, isn't it? Isn't it? It's kind of heavy right there, right? But I hope as we go through the message, you'll start to see how that verse applies to what we're talking about today. I'm actually really excited about this message because as many of you know, I'm a geek, right? And so I love learning things. And when I learn something, you know what I love to do? I love to talk about it, right? And that's a, that's a pretty good thing for somebody whose job is learning things and talking about them. Um, but today we get to combine some things that I, I get really excited about, and that is my love for scripture, my love for science, and yes, my love for history. Because although we find ourselves at this moment in time, there are a lot of things that went, came before this moment, right? There are a lot of things that came before this, um, and, and what people believe today is often shaped by what came before it, okay? And so in this series, we're talking about doubts. We're talking about questions that people have about Christianity. And one of the questions people have is this perceived tension that exists between the truth claims of the Bible and the truth claims of science. Anybody ever have any doubts because of this? The truth claims of the Bible versus the truth claims of science. Last week, I defined kind of what we're talking about when we use the word skeptic, right? The skeptic is simply someone who has, uh, has questions about something. So there's a truth claim that's made, and the skeptic says, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure whether I believe that or not. I'm not sure whether I believe that's true or not. And so Christianity and the Bible, they make a lot of truth claims, right? The Bible says things like this. The Bible says there's one true God. The Bible says that that one true God created everything. The Bible says that there is a definite right and wrong. There is a good and evil. The Bible says that human beings are actually loved by God and human beings are made with a purpose. Now, those are just some of the basic truth claims that the Bible makes, but those, it's those truth claims that actually Western culture is built upon those, right? Western culture is built upon those truth claims. Those, those beliefs have actually spawned what I believe is the greatest civilizations the world has ever seen are based upon that, those truths, right? And so today, there are those who actually say the opposite. Today, there are those who say uh, there is no God. Morality is relative. And human beings, what are they? They are simply the products of an evolutionary process. And how do we claim to know these things? Contrary to what the Bible says, how do we claim to know these things? They will credit this thing they call science. 
Everybody say that word with me. You ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Science. One more time. You can do it with gusto. Ready? Ready? One, two, three. Science. That word, science. Because we got to know what we're talking about, right? If we're going to use the word. That word science began to be used back in the 16th century. Then science referred to uh, fields like philosophy and mathematics and even theology were science, right? Back in the 16th century. In the 17th century, it began to take on the connotation of people who studied nature. Back then, by the way, those people were not called scientists yet. They were called natural philosophers. <laughs> People who contemplated and had questions about nature. People like Francis Bacon began to <clears throat> really press for, hey, we need a systematic method for observing nature, right? We need, to, we need a systematic way of experimenting. And then you get to the late uh, 19th century, early 20th century, and there's, this rise, there's a rise of this ideology called progressivism. Anybody ever heard of progressivism? Right? So there's this, the, the rise of progressivism. And, and the root of the progressive movement was, a, was an idea that um, humanity can actually create a perfect society. Right? Like we could actually create a perfect society and all we need is objectivity and reason and enough education. If we just had enough education, we can create a perfect society. The word for a perfect society is a utopia, right? And so that's what the progressive movement really pushed for. Um, and, and though some saw the teachings of Scripture as a means to that perfect society, there began to be more and more progressives who believed and had their sights on, on, set on, on creating a society that is secular and pragmatic, okay? Remember those two words, secular and pragmatic. Secular, what does secular mean? Secular means if we're going to create the perfect society, we have to remove all of its theological underpinnings right? All the things that the, this Western culture is built upon, if we're going to create a perfect society out of it, we got to remove all the theology, okay? And then pragmatic. Pragmatic means that the actions that that society ta takes are not based on any specific morality. It's whatever is the perceived best thing to do in a situation, right? There's no morality in it. It's just whatever in any situation is the best thing to do, that's what we need to be doing. Here's a little side note. Anybody ever read any of these books? Like novels like 1984, A Brave New World, Logan's Run. Man, they show us what it looks like when those two principles are achieved, by the way. It doesn't create a utopia. What does it create? It creates a dystopia, the opposite. So those things, those ideas were fueled in the late 1800s, early 1900s by a book that was published called The Origin of the Species by Charles Darwin. Ever hear of this book? Okay. The book was actually intended to explain within all the classifications of living things, and you remember learning those in, in high school, right? Um, all the classica classifications of living things how animals have different physical characteristics, yet some of them can still reproduce with one another, right? Example is like the, the African elephant, is, it looks very different from the Asian elephant, right? Yet they're able to reproduce with one another. Well, why is that when they look so different? So Darwin speculated, for example, that all mammals, not only do the, these two elephants have a common ancestor, but he speculated that all mammals have common ancestors. And so early progressives loved Darwin's theories. And they actually used 
Darwin's theories as a scientific basis for social change. You get that? A scientific basis for what kind of change? Social change. Because they believed for society to evolve into that utopian state, to that perfect society, it had to be secular and pragmatic. And so here's what I'm going to, I know I'm shooting pretty high over, like really high this morning. We'll, we'll, we'll make it understandable. Um, but here's what I'll propose to you. Much of the perceived conflict between science and faith is actually a construct created by the progressive movement that sought to use science as a basis for social change. And today, we are presented with a false choice. Okay? We're presented with a, with a false choice. Today, we're told that we either believe the Bible or science because science has disproven the Bible. We're given a false choice. You have to choose one or the other because science proves the Bible is false. Is that really our choice? Has science disproven the Bible? Because that didn't seem to be the choice before the progressive movement. Before that time period, that wasn't the choice. How do we know? Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Isaac Newton, all astronomers, what did those people believe? They believed Psalm 19, 1 through 4, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech, night after night, they reveal knowledge, they have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth their words to the end of the world. Those people, very brilliant people, they weren't stupid. What do they believe? Robert Boyle, the father of modern chemistry, said that we act according to laws which have been established by Almighty God, the father of modern chemistry. Michael Faraday, a pioneer in electromagnetism and electrochemistry, he said, I cannot be silent, I must speak. I cannot say that I have no faith. I cannot say that I do not believe in God. I cannot help it. I cannot help it, he said. Louis Pasteur, the father of microbiology, said, the more I study nature, the more I stand amazed at the work of the Creator. Gregor Mendel, the father of modern genetics, the Lord has been pleased to reveal to me the laws of nature. All of these people, were they dummies? They were incredibly brilliant people, incredibly intelligent people, and all devoted Christians who did not believe that the Bible and science were at odds. Even Albert Einstein, and though he did not consider himself religious, but there was an article in the Saturday Evening Post in October of 1929 where he said this. He said, I am not an atheist. The problem involved is too vast for our limited minds. We are in a position like a little child entering this huge library filled with books in many languages. The child knows someone must have written those books, but he does not know how, doesn't understand the languages in which they were written. The child dimly suspects a mysterious order in the arrangement of the books, but doesn't know what it is. And that seems to me, he says, is the attitude that even the most intelligent human being has toward God. 
We see the universe mysteriously arranged and obeying certain laws, but we only dimly understand them. Brothers and sisters, that was the attitude. And that's really the proper place to start, isn't it? When it comes to science, you know, the, the word science is brought into English from Latin. The word science simply just means knowledge. Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. You want knowledge, where do you begin? With that healthy respect of God and who he is. And brothers and sisters, I love knowledge. I love science. And I know all the people that I mentioned were from a long time ago. I know science has come a long way since they made their discoveries. And you might say, well, they didn't know any better. It was back then, right? That was the culture back then. Everyone back then believed in God. Well, you know what? One of the greatest scientific discoveries of my lifetime has been this thing called the Human Genome Project. Anybody ever hear of that, that, that project? It was a project that actually went on from 1990 to 2003. And um, I'll be honest with you, when I first read about it, it creeped me out a little bit, right? Because um, today it's common knowledge. We, we operate this way. But, but back then, this thing called the Human Genome Project s- sought to understand the genet- genetic blueprint that makes us human beings, okay? So it kind of dove into the, the DNA and try to understand what DNA is. And at the forefront of that initiative was this guy, Dr. Francis Collins, and he wanted to map out human DNA. He found out that there are uh, three billion base pairs in human DNA. He wanted to find out how the variations and how these are arranged, how that leads to certain diseases, and, and they wanted to advance genetics so that they could find cures for human diseases. Well, after working on this project, it became clear to Francis Collins that what he was seeing as he studied human DNA was not the product of natural selection and genetic mutation. It became clear to him that what he was seeing was something that was actually designed. And Collins even wrote a book called The Language of God. Collins says that DNA is the language of God, and he speaks about how discovering the complexity and the beauty of the human genome deepened his awe for the creation. He stated that studying the human genome gave him a sense of awe of the mystery of life, which contributed to his conversion from atheism to Christianity. Francis Collins is not an ignorant man. He is a brilliant scientist, and he does not see a conflict between faith and science. He believes, Psalm 139, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know them full well. I remember a friend of mine, his name is Jason Ely. He brought this, uh, it's been years ago. He brought this magazine into my office, and uh, it was an issue of Wired magazine that he wanted me to read. He'd read, read through it, and he brought it to me, and it was back in 2006, and the cover of the magazine read, The New Atheism, No Heaven, No Hell, Just Science, Inside the Crusade Against Religion. You open up the magazine, and inside the magazine is by, you know, things written by people like Richard Dawkins, who is an evolutionary bi- biologist, and he argues that atheism should be a political issue. And he actively promotes the virtues of atheism. He believes that belief in God 
is a dangerous idea, and he advocates for protecting children from religious indoctrination. Sam Harris says the belief in God must be eradicated. To prevent social conflict, he proposes a religion of reason to maximize human happiness. Daniel Dennett suggests that the belief in God needs to be replaced with a secular substitute. This new religion they advocate for is called science. And after reading the magazine, I realized they're using the word science in a totally different way than from what I believe the word science means. It's not the same thing. Because when I say science, I mean this endeavor to learn something with, within a particular field of study. When they say science, they're referring to this brand new religion. And then in April 2008, there was this documentary released. I don't know if you've seen it. It was called Expelled that showed that there, is actually, there was actually a movement within academia. There's actually a movement within the sciences where authors, editors, even tenured college professors were being fired. I thought you couldn't do that, right? Well, they were doing it because they questioned the validity of something like Darwinian evolution, right? They would lose their jobs for just mentioning the possibility of God or something like uh, intelligent design or that there's a metaphysical origin to the physical world. And so there's that movement of those new atheists, right? They were making it so you could do science, but you could only come up with the answer they wanted you to come up with, and that is there is no God. Well, that is not science, brothers and sisters. That's atheistic propaganda. And so I'll be honest with you, when, when it comes to a lot of the assertions we hear in popular science, who's the skeptic? I'm the skeptic. Because I don't automatically trust what I'm told. Why? Because in my lifetime, I have seen the agenda. In my lifetime, I have context, right? In my experiences, there's not anything that science has actually discovered about the physical world that threatens my belief that it was created by Almighty God. Let me say that to you again. There's nothing that's actually been discovered that threatens my belief in the creation of Almighty God. There was a guy that used to go around. His name was Anthony Flew, very well-known British philosopher. He used to be one of those guys who would go around. I don't know if you've seen these on YouTube or not, but... Uh, he used to be one of those guys that would go around and he would hold these big public debates and he would invite Christians in to debate him, okay? And he was an atheist. And, um, just to be honest with you, he would destroy these Christians <laughs> that came in, that challenged him. Um, he would bring with him this scientific knowledge. He would bring with him philosophical arguments. And it didn't help that he was just an amazing debater, Right? So Anthony Flew died on April 8th, 2010, at the age of 87. A few years before he died, he published a book titled, There Is a God. And in that book, Flew asserts that atheism is no longer a logical, tenable, or defensible position to hold. at the age of 76. He was a theoretical physicist known for his work on, on space, black holes, cosmology. He had this theory of everything, which was kind of a continuation of something that Einstein had started um, and had to be perfect for the universe to come into existence. 
and he writes in this book called A Brief History of Time. He says this, the odds against the universe, a universe like ours, emerging out of something like a Big Bang are enormous. And then he says, I think there are religious implications. We started by reading Romans 1, 18 through 20. And Paul says in those verses, yes, there are religious implications. Whenever we take an honest look at the creation, what do we see? We see evidence of a creator. Hebrews 11.3 By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. This morning, we didn't go through all of the different arguments. We didn't bring up all the different ways, all the different things that people discuss when they discuss religion and science. I just want you to see today they're not at odds. Belief systems are at odds. Things that people presuppose help us to define how we interpret the data. Those, those belief systems are at odds. But the actual data, the actual science is not the opposite of faith. And I've encouraged you this morning. I don't know where you stand on that. I don't know what you believe about that. But our God is trustworthy. Our God has proven himself. And our God, we can see him when we just simply walk outside and look at nature. And one of the, the truth claims that we talked about as we started off is the fact that God loves you and you have a purpose when we, we go through the scripture and we talk about Jesus, that's the whole reason Jesus came to us is because we're lost, we've sinned. You come forward as a person who believes, who's willing to make that change in your life. You be joined with him in his death, burial, and resurrection by being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You come forward today as we all stand up together and as we sing this song.